Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, May 18th, 2023, and this is the week in charts. I'll be showing. I thank all you guys and girls for attending. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. So what are we can talk about? Well, obviously, current market conditions. I have a lot to say about that. The good news is it's looking better. Your questions on trading, your favorite stock and crypto picks. We're going to do crypto first when we get through the, with the slides. If you don't mind, hold off until we get to the slides so I can keep the questions separate. And same thing goes for stocks. We'll do crypto first, again, after the slides. I want to do a brief update on the fact that markets are markets. I want to show you the crypto position that I put on a few weeks ago. I put on like three or four and one. They all hit the IPT, but one continued to follow through. So we'll follow up on that tonight. And we'll take a look at live charts too again. All right. Uh, as I often say, just, just tell me what you want me to cover, and I'll be happy to cover it. It makes my job a lot easier. Kind of reminds me of my wife. My wife, she's like a... Just tell me what you want to eat. Just tell me what you want to cook. I was like, okay, uh, <laughs> shrimp stew. Ah, I don't feel like that, you know, or just bake a chicken. Ah, I don't feel like that. But anyway, but um, I'll be happy to cover whatever you guys want. So along those lines, I want to talk about how to go about system designing and research. And it's going to probably take us more than just tonight based on the length of the questions and the amount of questions that were asked. But we're going to get through as much as of that as possible. And I'll follow up in coming weeks. Because the disclaimer screen, as you know, you can lose money trading or as often summing up all predictions or about the future. You know, a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. All right. So let's do a brief update on the crypto position. So markets are markets. What works in one market works in others. Sometimes certain markets will work better than others. Uh, more inefficient type of markets tend to be my favorite ones to trade. Crypto is one of those inefficient markets now. And uh, smaller cap stocks within reason. And sometimes big cap stocks can make inefficient moves at certain times. But anyway, markets are markets because human nature is human nature. So this was one, and uh, we'll update it in a few minutes when we get to the live chart. So that was the original trade. I'm not betting the form in crypto, as I said last few weeks. But I got in on a pullback, and the initial profit target was right there. And in that webinar, I wrote, this is three weeks ago, the next big thing, question mark, or maybe four weeks ago now. And so far, so good, knock on wood. Now, remember, once we get the IPT out of a position, we then bump our stop up to break even. And hopefully, I don't know, just word, use the word hope, but hopefully we're worth that position for a long, 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 long time. And that's where the real money is in those free roll type of trades. All right, we're going to just jump right in the mailbag here. And I got this question yesterday. And we're going to try to get through as much as possible. But before we do that, I want to talk a little bit about what I do and how I think about markets and how I find things and so on and so forth. And I think that's going to answer a lot of these questions. And then toward the end, or once I get through talking about that, I want to pick apart or answer, I should say, each individual line to the best I can. And then again, we'll follow up over, over coming, coming weeks. So before we do that, keep in mind that most of my trading comes from picking stocks. And 90% of that can be taught quickly. If you follow along in the Facebook group, you'll know to somebody will say, hey, I like this stock. And I'm like, you know, it's got a big gap against the trend in the setup. And it, uh, it, or it might have some overhead resistance, or it's kind of wide and loose, or the trend is decelerating, or the trend is mostly one or two or three bars. And 90% of that is is pretty easy, and you should be able to recognize it. And then, obviously, if you're new to trading, you, you might not notice all these things. But as I point them out over and over and over again, and like yesterday, I put a crappy example out there to see what you guys thought, and y'all immediately do what I was doing. You know, I was kind of fishing for comments. And the point is that the stock picking is not that hard, but it does take some time. It does take some experience. So 90% can be taught really quickly. Again, uh, watch for overhead supply, gaps against the trend, laps against the trend, uh, deceleration, like I just said, ability for the stock to trade cleanly, persistency, acceleration of trend. And I know I'm kind of being redundant here, but all of these things are fairly easily taught. It's the getting used to seeing them and being able to see them and see clearly and see what is 
that takes a little bit of while. Like one of my clients often says, it's kind of caught, not taught. Now, I do pay attention to signals such as the TFM temper system and major bow ties, a major bow tie is something coming off of an all-time high in the market, or at least a multi-year low for lows and things like that. And I'll flesh out what I do somewhat mechanically here in a little while. And by the way, I've become friendly with mechanical. People do things uh, on a somewhat of a mechanical basis and they um, they kind of see me as being more mechanical than I kind of let on. And I kind of see them as being a little bit more discretionary than they let on. So I think it's okay once you develop your methodology to, to be a little mechanical in a lot of things you do. And a lot of things, like I just said, those could actually be mechanical things. Not that you want to program them in, but you want to have a, a checklist. And I'm actually working on a checklist of these things to look for, such as, again, overhead supply, et cetera. Now, as I'll mention throughout tonight and forever, a lot of my research is empirical. And, you know, maybe if I do find something that's kind of interesting, then I'll go in and do some hardcore research on it. But most of the stuff I do is just by looking at charts and looking at charts over and over and over and over and over again. And I look at a couple thousand stocks every night and I look at a couple hundred IPOs every day. And then I watch the market way more than I should all day long. <laughs> and I'm looking at sectors and all the ETFs. And then lately I've been fascinated with these zero DTE options, which is it's kind of like a, a lot of trading. It's like right when you're about ready to get up, give up, you just knock it out of the park and that kind of sucks you back in. Anyway, well, I have a lot more to say about that in the future. Now, one thing, for instance, here's kind of like the empirical research and then I was working on an IPO course, I guess it's probably been, it's, I don't know how long it's been, maybe 10 years ago. And in some of that research, I noticed that many IPOs die out during the first week of trading. And I just sorted IPOs tonight by volume. And this happened to be the first one that come came up. And I'm like, ah, oh, perfect. Exactly what I'm pointing out. Notice that this thing came public and just pretty much died out. And the other thing I noticed is that well, many never take out the day one high okay so they'll make a high on day one and that high is never exceeded so it's like people all the time there say well dave when when should i buy this new hot ipo or it's supposed to be a hot ipo and i was like and i'm always like well wait till at least to close of day five and let's see how it shakes out before putting your hard-earned money or putting your capital in harm's way i should say so notice that it never did take out that day one high before it imploded now that gave me a rule, wait at least five days or the close of the fifth day before buying any IPO. And then since the day one high often sets the high for the week, the IPO must close above that high before I'll consider it. So you can kind of see where I'm going with this. This is the buy at B pattern. And I'm not going to teach you the whole pattern tonight because I've, I've done it a million times before. But I just want to kind of show you where that came from. So. My other thinking is if an IPO is, is going to go to the moon, it's going to have to close at a new high first. So at least the close of day five, which you have here, and you can see this stock began to take off afterwards. So therefore, with a few caveats like price, volume, range, et cetera, consider buying IPOs at new closing highs on day five or later. So that's how I came up with the buy at B setup. Now, the beauty of the buy at B is it's a little bit more mechanical than a lot of stuff that I do. It's gonna take a while for you to learn how to trade pullbacks properly. You're gonna to have to make sure the trend is solid enough, the pullback is deep enough, and all the other stock selection stuff that I kind of alluded to a second ago. But something like this, with a little bit of work, and I know John's in here tonight, John Ross like took the ball and ran with it, or run with, I always get this, uh, those confused. But anyway, uh, and he's done quite well with the IPOs. He's our resident IPO expert now in the Facebook groups, and I think that's that's awesome. 
and it's something that he picked up on quickly. Now, shifting gears a little bit, does this, you think this is a good system? Is this a good signal? It looks pretty good to me. Well, this came off of a tweet, and it's a joke, obviously. But I was sitting here a few days ago, and the squirrel hops up on my little bear that I have outside my office. He's got a little bow tie on. You can't see it from the side, but he's got a little bow tie on. And he, like, climbed up on the little railing we have here and shat, literally shot on his head. <laughs> And then he puts nuts in his face. And so I'm thinking like, all right, well, there's a sign that the bear market's over. And as you can see, going back a slide, it worked out pretty good, right? Well, obviously that's not conceptually correct. So it must be conceptually correct. Now, I never heard of that term until I was doing some research with Larry Connors many years ago. And I fat fingered something in my programming as you often do if, if you ever programmed a computer. And we've got some really good results out of something, and then we couldn't figure out why it was working. And I showed it to Larry and everything, and it just wasn't conceptually correct. It just so happened to work. So anything that's not conceptually correct, Larry said we have to toss out. Now, let me kind of explain conceptually correct to you. Take Landry light pullbacks, for instance. Landry light is lows greater than pull than the uh, moving average, right? And we're looking for 10 days and ideally maybe 20 or more days to show that the market's trending. Now, there's some caveats there too. We want some acceleration. We want some solid, make sure it's a solid trend. And then we're looking for a pullback to the moving average. And we look to buy if and only if it triggers an entry. So my thinking behind this pattern and pullbacks in general is strong trends equal demand for a market and the correction knocks out the weak hands and the trend knockout is a pattern i often like to talk about when it comes to psychology of the psychology of technical analysis and if you think about it technical analysis is based on the psychology of the market players we're looking to read the mindset of the market by looking at the charts okay and in something like a trend knockout, you got a really strong trend and you get this knockout bar. Well, you know that some shorts got attracted in. You know that some longer term trend traders probably got knocked out. You know that the Johnny come lately, so we're very, very fickle and have very little money, very little staying power, very little patience, or very emotional. They tend to be the last ones in and the first ones out. It can often wreak havoc on your positions, and that creates that knockout bar. And I've actually been long stocks and get knocked out on a knockout bar and I'll dust myself off, pick myself up, dust myself off, you know, like the Peter Tosh song. And I look at the chart and say, you know, this chart looks pretty good. And the next day, go right back in that same stock on a re-trigger, of course. So there has to be some sort of concept behind what you're doing that's conceptually correct. So, for instance, I, I know the little squirrel example is kind of stupid at uh eighth grade sophomore or whatever but like in one of the market wizards or, or one of the books that i read here it um it said that that somebody noticed that when when the cows were on one side of the field soybean prices went up and it happened to be a fairly robust type of system but obviously they wouldn't trade off of it or didn't trade off of it because conceptually they couldn't prove that there was a concept to to trade off of. It didn't make sense. It was not conceptually correct, in other words. You're welcome, John. Now, when a pullback triggers, it suggests that, that doesn't guarantee, obviously, that the longer term trend is resuming. And that's why we want to pick the best and leave the rest and make sure we're getting into strongest stocks that are accelerating and all those other good things I just talked about, all those trend qualifiers to make sure it's looking really, really good. Pick the best and leave the rest. Now, it's got to be simple, and you got to be careful because complexity is going to equal curve fitting. The more you noodle, if you're doing a mechanical system, for instance, the more you noodle with and the more parameters you add in, it's going to become more and more complex, and you're going to end up curve fitting. And I guarantee you that system is going to blow up pretty quickly. So I would work to to come up with something really, really, really simple. And I'm gonna kind of pick apart a little bit the 
TFM 10% system in just one second. But I can guarantee you, if you come up with a complex system, you have curve fit to the prior data, and that's not going to act that way in the future. Now, getting to the TFM 10% system, I figured if we talked about how I developed this system, maybe it'll give you kind of like a little insight into how I think, just like we talked about the BIAB a few minutes ago. So my designer's intent with the TFM 10% system is to, one, of course, show that a simple system could work, and that's that's basically all my research. When I did the 220 EMA breakout system back in 95, I think it was actually published in 96, I wrote it in 95, I was looking to prove that a simple system could work in the Japanese yen. So in this case, my designer's intent was to avoid the diaper change moments. Ian McActivy, great speaker, all around great guy, awesome dude, as I often say. He was my canary in the coal mine, you know. He smoked a lot. He uh, he didn't drink a lot, but he drank, you know. And I'm like, okay, when he goes, maybe I need to <laughs> tap the brakes on my lifestyle a little bit. And unfortunately, uh, he left this earth way too soon, but he was awesome. Anyway, if a market's going to lose 50% of its value, it's going to lose 10% first, okay? So my thinking was, once the market begins to drop from the 50-week closing highs, and once it drops 10% or more from that level, I need to think about getting out of that market. Now, that's not an individual stock. An individual stock obviously could do that in one day. But the overall market in general, especially for the S&P 500, although I did take a Q signal, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. But overall, 10% is a pretty good round number for like the S&P 500. If the S&P 500 drops 10%, it's probably in trouble. And here's the amazing thing. No guarantees, right? It's a free system anyway, so I'll refund your money. <laughs> but uh, if you look at every sell-off in history, there was a 10% drop. And then the market really imploded. It's not like the market drops 50% overnight. It kind of gradually rolls over. And I've done presentations before where I show where you have these somewhat gradual, it always feels like the market just tanks and, and crashes, right? But if you actually go back and look at it, it might have gone sideways for four months or sometimes even longer before rolling over. Now, sometimes it happens a little bit more quickly, but usually it'll drop that 10% and it's kind of like the, the clock is ticking if it's going to get worse, unless it goes right back up, obviously. But anyway, now I did throw in a 50-week moving average to help reduce the whipsaw. And then I actually recently, or not that long ago, I should say, went back in and, and tried to take out the moving average and just see how it worked with just a 10% indicator. And it didn't work as well. So if you do add more and more indicators, especially like your whipsaw filters, Make sure you back those, try to back them out and see if you can live without them. But I ended up with two indicators, so to speak, and they're both based on the action of price itself. So you're not waiting for a moving average to turn up or turn down or cross over, like things of that nature. Anyway, so I use the 50 week moving average to help reduce the whipsaw. Now for a sell signal, because they slide faster than they glide, and you pilots out there, don't, don't get me shit about that i know that a glide actually goes down but you know glide higher as opposed to diving lower right take the escalator up and the elevator down all the other adages but stuff comes unglued quickly right so for sales it just has to close below the 10 percent line which is which is 10 percent, or i should say 90 percent of the 50-week closing highs the way it's programmed in the acp platform so after a 10% drop from the 50-week closing high, it's based on the close, not the high high, but the closing high, then if it's also below the 50-week moving average, this is a weekly chart we're using it on, okay, then you need to exit the market. Now, of course, I'm looking at bow ties, and I'm looking at Landry Light, and I'm looking at other moving averages and all these other good things when I'm doing this. And of course, the blank chart and measuring the net net move too. But this is one pretty serious signal that I do tend to heed. Now, excuse me, it doesn't mean that I exit every stock I'm long, okay? I just get a little bit more picky on new positions, okay? 
because every now and then you have a stock that just keeps on going. We had one that went up another couple hundred percent, even though the market rolled over about a year ago or whatever. So you don't, and I've given complete present every time the market rolls over, I give a complete presentation on this. And knock on wood, I've been lucky several times, and that one out of however many stocks were long continues to go up and really makes a big difference, even though the market rolls over. Doesn't happen all the time. I wish it did. But anyway. Now, for sales, it's just got to close again below that buy line, 10% away from the 50-week closing high and below the 50-week moving average. Now, for the buys to avoid whipsaw, and this is really the, really the big whipsaw filter here, the 50-day the simple moving average is more of a whipsaw filter for getting you back in too early. And it has to have two bars of Landry light above the 50. So that means that the trend is beginning to accelerate. When you get the, the Landry light above the moving average, that means the market is starting to pull away from its average. It means that it's starting to outperform compared to how it was performing. So that could be the beginnings of the acceleration. That's part of the 230 EMA or 220 EMA system that I alluded to a minute ago. So two bars of Landry light, and then it has to be within 10% of the 50-week closing on. That's the entire system right there. So here was a sell signal in the queues. You could see the high for the i know the high in the sp i think was on the 31st looks like the nasdaq topped out a little bit earlier than that okay but notice that it didn't top out and then drop what is this 30 something percent 35 percent okay it didn't it didn't top out and then immediately drop 35 percent it kind of meandered back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and then it eventually dropped 10 percent well, once it drops 10%, you need to put on your Scooby hat, uh, your rut row hat, what's the dog's name, <laughs> Rover, and think about getting outs of the way. Now, recently, we had a buy signal, and I actually took this buy signal, and I went in, and I did some quick hand testing, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about hand testing in a few minutes, but Astro, okay, yeah, <laughs> rut row. Uh, what was the uh yeah Astro went row row. What did uh didn't Scooby's Scooby's dog do that? Anyway, so it went a buy signal here and I went in and did some hand testing. And when you hand test, and that's one thing I want to get into tonight, but I don't know if we have enough time. But one thing you want to do just real quick is go in and bar by bar, look at every single bar and see how your system, so to speak, would perform. Now, you don't want to do everything mechanical on a mechanical basis, but there are some times where a mechanical system might kind of get you into a market or help to alert you to, to something that's happening. So, for instance, just for SGs, I said, well, I guess well, I guess I'll take this signal here. And the queues have to look at that. It looks pretty robust. I think it's worth a shot. And so I got in at 319.49, so 319.50 round numbers. And knock on wood, okay, let's not start kissing each other just yet, but it's worked out fairly well. Now, was I bearish? What was that? Uh, or bullish? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So it's about eight weeks ago, and I put up a post on my website for the peas when that happened there too. But was I bullish eight weeks ago? Eh, not really, you know, and I don't know if I'm that bullish now. It stands today's action, right? A little bit more bullish at the end of the day than the beginning of the day. But here's a system telling you, hey, this is a buy signal. You might want to check it out. So for s and I bought 100 shares, and it's working out. Knock a wood. Not bragging yet. Now, don't reinvent the wheel. And that's a thing I really need to drive the point home. And it's like, it's like everybody has to go on their own little grail hunt. And I've seen it happen so many times. It's like somebody new to come, new to come to me. And I'll start working with them and they'll start getting in and it'll start clicking. And then all of a sudden they're doing all these other things and chasing all these other rabbits and do something that that's already been done. And as I'm going to kind of allude to in a minute here, a lot of things all look the same anyway. And, and I'm not the grand poobah. I think I've got some really good stuff. But there's a lot of other people's stuff that probably looks and acts a lot like my stuff, okay? So I would encourage you not to go in and reinvent the wheel. I've spent almost, I wanna say 30, but it's probably 25 years 
I've been married 25 years and I was trading before I met my wife. So yeah, it's probably 30 years just working on the pullback, you know? So learn how to trade pullbacks from, learn from a lot of the stuff that I've done. And then if you want to put your own little spin on it or tweaks on it, that's fine. But don't go out and reinvent the wheel because it's like you're, it's like you're learning, you're learning, you're learning, and the learning curve is like starts doing this, and all of a sudden you start over and like, oh, I'm gonna start doing this and doing that, and before you know it, you're going straight up. And I guess I do some of that too, but as a general statement, I stick to my core methodology. So 35, 30, uh, 25, probably 35, probably 30 years. Whew, one cup of coffee next time, Dave. So use, you know, use me as a base. Uh, I, I've stood on the shoulders of, I'm not a giant. I mean, I'm a pretty big dude, <laughs> but I'm not a giant. But uh, I've stood on a lot of giant shoulders to get here. So take my work and stand on my shoulders. Now, this is a point I was kind of hinting at a minute ago. Know that all representative systems will have similar nuances, trend following, reversion to the mean, Etc. So ask yourself, what is your system? And all systems fit into a category. I recently got a, a letter <laughs> from someone who was wondering if I could help them do a little programming, and they're doing some system development. This is a client that I've had for on and off for years, and I haven't gotten back in touch with him. But if he happens to be watching tonight, I would tell him that there's a 99% chance that your system is gonna look a lot like any other system out there. It could all be boiled down to, are you a trend follower or not, okay? And then within the trend follower, different sects, for instance, like breakout, breakouts are gonna, are gonna work great to get you into every trending market there is, but your accuracy is gonna be abysmal and you're gonna lose more often than you win. Maybe longer term, it'll work out. So along those lines, for instance, reversion to the mean is usually highly accurate. And the thing is, it'll work until it don't. It's a great way to have a very brief but brilliant career on Wall Street. The reversion to the mean systems tend to blow up. Selling naked options will work until it don't. And there was a, I don't want to be shot on Friday, believe me, I'm not, but there was some woman that was famously interviewed on the on youtube you can still find it out there if you dig around i could help you find it and uh not to take anything away from her but i think she ended up she started options trading selling decade options and then before you knew it she was running like a hundred million dollars and then it all blew up and i think she's in a little bit of trouble for that so it will work until it don't believe me i've 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 been there done that got the t-shirt and I have um, the scars to prove it, two drink minimum on that. Now, William Eckert comes to mind, the desire to maximize the number of winning trades or minimize the number of losing trades. And you know, that's important. I, I always kind of gloss over that, minimize the number of losing trades, because you don't think of that as a, a grail hunt, but you start programming and noodling and with, with things, and you keep trying to, oh, we got this loser. Well, if this, parameter here was set to this, we wouldn't have that losing trade. Well, I look, kind of look like, what's this, Lewis Black? But in the future, there's going to be something else that's going to cause a losing trade. Before you know it, that's where the curve fitting cuts it, comes in. But anyway, the desire to maximize the number of winning trades or minimize the number of losing trades works against the trader. The success rate of trades is the least important performance statistic and may even be inversely related to performance, okay? You could eat like a bird and shit like an elephant and probably do really well for a long time. That means that you're taking little, 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 bitty, 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 tiny profits, okay? And then you take a huge loss. As I was going live here, I was just kind of checking in on my Facebook group before coming live. And in, in my feed, somebody's like 80 to 90% day trade signals. Like, okay, well, they probably are 80 to 90% accurate, but what they're not telling you is what happens when you lose on a trade. And just kind of random thought, I remember a while back, somebody sent out their, their track record to their clients or whatever, 
and they sent me a copy and so i did the math on it they were profitable but i did the math on it and they were making on average five cents a trade literally five cents a trade on average and that's kind of scary because if your execution isn't completely right and let's say you lose a dollar on a trade well now it's going to take 20 trades on average to make up for that one dollar loss what feels good over the short term is often detrimental over the longer term when it comes to systems and believe me i've said this before i've gotten more pure reversion to the mean type clients than any other prior methodology combined. Now, pure trend following, something like the turtles did and a lot of my system testing way back in the day, I, I got out every technical analysis book I could find and went through every indicator and multiple bastardizations thereof. And the number that just kept coming up, you know, somewhere between like 22 and 30% accurate 30 percent is actually high for a trend following system and the drawdowns were absolutely abysmal now as i say quite often not to take anything away from the turtles because i think what they did was fantastic but they happen to be in the right place at the right time and since a lot of the turtles have no are no, are no longer successful because they were in the right place at the right time and their simple systems worked really really well but the drawdowns were were very large even back then even when the times were good in fact they actually discovered about halfway through the program that at the rate they were going they were on the cusp of blowing up and they immediately scaled back their position sizing and then afterwards again a lot of them did blow up now longer term trends are where the money is okay and by the way in order to profit from a trade you have to capture a trend. You have to capture a trend. You have to sell higher than you buy or cover lower than you short. That move is a trend. Now, short-term systems, you're gonna get a little bit more accurate with those, but the problem is it, it doesn't make enough and shit still happens, okay? So this, I guess this gentleman's making five cents a trade Again, if he gets spanked on one trade for a buck, it's going to take 20 trades to come back. So bad things can still happen, even over the short term. People think, well, I'm only going to be in the market for a few days. Well, you know, as long as a crash doesn't happen in those few days or the Fed does something or make it an off-the-cuff remark or whatever, in this day and age, it seems like there's a lot of uh, idiots out there. But that's another story. Now, my system, so to speak, is short-term plus long-term. It's a bit of a hybrid approach, and the money management is ingrained into it, or integrated into it. I don't know the correct terminology there. So it still has some of the nuances of short-term trading and some of the nuances of longer-term trading. We still have drawdowns. We still have extended periods of flat time, which, believe me, suck. <laughs> I can always tell we're getting ready to just knock it out of the park. You know, when everybody starts quitting the service, it's like, okay, we're getting closer and closer. Now, in general, it, it keeps you in the game until you knock it out of the park. So if you make it, if you make the initial profit target and stop out, you do that a few times, and before you know it, you got your accounts two or three percent higher, maybe four percent higher, and then you get whacked on a couple of them. Now that four percent just evaporated and you're back, you're barely above water, or then you start going into a drawdown, and it can be tough, but eventually you start catching a few really good stocks, the market conditions overall improve, or the sector conditions improve, and then one or two begin to take off, and then that makes your whole year, and it's a tough way to trade, and, I'm, and I've tried everything, and as tough as it is, it's the best thing that I have found after many, many, many years of searching. Now, one thing you have to ask yourself is, can you follow it, okay? So let's say you come up with some sort of system or methodology. The question you have to ask yourself is, can you follow it? And I met someone once, it was actually Jake Bernstein down in Australia, and he, at this conference, we were on a panel together, and he said that he had this 
system that he just couldn't follow it, but he knew there was an edge and he paid someone to follow it. And he said, if you don't follow it to a T, I'm going to fire you. So I thought that was kind of interesting. And that's a problem we're seeing now. It's like I tell everybody, be patient, be patient, sit on your hands, sit on your hands, sit on your hands. Everybody gives up. And then what happens? The market takes off. Now, I've got a, a folder with my Eckhart quotes that I'm going to work into books and stuff. And I just read the first couple of lines and I knew that if I went down that rabbit hole, this would be a, a William Eckhart presentation. But I thought it was easy. I thought it was kind of interesting. This, this little quote sort of dovetails in what we're talking about. It's much easier to learn what you should do in trading than do it. Amen. <laughs> Good systems tend to violate normal human tendencies okay if you took your par partial profits off and you're trailing your stop and you're letting that stop widen out and that market starts rolling over okay it's going to be really tempting to get out long before that stop is hit when that market starts banging out new highs it's going to be really tempted tempting to mentally monetize that and not let that draw down into your account so it's tough OK, and I don't want to make it sound like it's easy, but the, the systems that tend to work the best are the hardest to follow, I think is what he's saying. And and I fully agree. It's hard to trend follow. It's a lot easier to you know get into something and then flip it out and then you know, do all this other crazy stuff than it is to actually follow a longer term trend. Now, one thing you want to do is play devil's advocate and. I've been sent hundreds of systems over the years and or methodologies or whatever. Well, I'm selling these calls and then I'm selling these puts and then all this other stuff. And I always tell them the same thing. It's like, well, you know, that makes me nervous. But I tell you what, you trade that system for two years, okay? And then email me and tell me how you're doing. And knock on, not knock on wood, but uh, so far, and I've been publicly doing this 20 something years, over 25 years, I guess. Not one person has emailed me back after two years with any system that has that blow up characteristic. Now, I will tell you this I've seen stuff, and again, two drink minimum, <laughs> some horror stories, but I've seen some stuff work for like 20 years and then blow up. If that characteristic is there, it's there. One thing that I wrote about recently, and I don't think it's an original thought, so if I could find the original thought, that would be great. If, if somebody knows, leave me a comment below if you're watching this on YouTube. But it's like a hundred chambered revolver with one bullet in it, okay? And you're playing Russian roulette. Well, the chances of that bullet getting hit, you know, when you pull the trigger, they're never nil, you know, even if you like you just, okay, make it completely random. It's never nil, okay? There's always a little chance in there. And statistically, it could go a long, long time before you get killed, so to speak. So make sure you're playing devil's advocate. When you're looking at your, your charts, go in and look at when it works, but then seek out times when it doesn't work. What book or the Eckerd quotes from? I picked them up from a variety of books. Um, I like Curtis Faith's book on the turtles. I think it's the way of the turtles. Like I said a million times, I, I said I'm never gonna, I'm not gonna watch those. Um, I'm not gonna read those turtle books, you know, because <laughs> I just thought it was kind of dumb. Everybody's trying to capitalize and make money off of them. And, uh, but I, I thought that it was interesting. Curtis Faith wrote a book and then uh, Larry Williams told me, Larry Williams, Larry McMillan, sorry. These are the Larrys I know. <laughs> I know them both. I, little, I know McMillan better. Uh, but Larry told me, Larry McMillan told me, he goes, you know, it's actually pretty good. He talked about, Curtis Faith talked about how they had a ping pong table in the back of the office. They play ping pong when there was nothing going on, and it sounded kind of interesting. It turns out it was a pretty good book. And if Larry Midland tells me to read a book, I'm gonna read it. I was just reading his options book earlier today. I know you wanna to party with me. <laughs>
but it was pretty good. So that's the way of the turtle. Uh, it also read, if you go to daveland.com slash books dash two dash read, Curtis Faith's book, Trading from the Gut, is pretty good too. And I think he quotes Eckert in there. Uh, Eckert is in one of the market wizards. So that's probably where some of the quotes come from. But yeah, I've got a I've got a couple of pages of quotes from him. And I just, I guess I collected them over the years. And you know, you can go to like, um, there's quote websites and you can put his name in too. Now, as I said earlier, you want to hand test everything, ideally bar by bar. And you know, take look at a bar and then decide what you want to do and then go one bar forward and decide what you want to do. Only thing I'd warn you about in doing that is if you're using like a moving average or something, Years ago, a hedge fund contacted me, or soon to be hedge fund, and uh, this guy thought he had the holy grail. And we, it's kind of a long story, but long story endless. At one point in time, one of his signals was based on, I know I've said this before, was based on a moving average turning up. And when I was doing the hand testing, just like this on the screen, I actually wore out several mice by clicking. Anyway, I noticed that the turn up happened, but the turn up was using the next day's data, which was just off the screen. And in the printouts, it was the same thing. You could look at the printouts and see, okay, here's your buy signal playing this day, but that was using tomorrow's day data. If I had tomorrow's data, you'd never see my fat ass again, believe me. I love you guys, but. <laughs> now, empirical research is the best research. How did I discover a fantastic way to trade IPOs. Well, I looked at a lot of IPOs and I said, aha, a lot of these things just go straight down and never go up. And then I dug a little further and said, a lot of them make the high in the first day. And it's something that I've done a thousand times. And like I said, a second ago, I look at a couple thousand stocks every day. And by the way, you want to, as I've said before, and one of you guys actually gave me the idea, but he was talking about counterfeit currency detectives. Well, counterfeit currency detectives, they don't go out and, and study, uh, I got a hundred trillion right here. Uh, they, they don't go out and study a bunch of monopoly money. They they look at a real dollar bill and they look for the, the markers and the thread and the feel. And there's all kinds of things to to prevent counterfeiting. And as you get better and better and better at looking at the genuine article, the fakes will stick out like a sore thumb. So start looking at stocks that move, that take off, and, and realize not every move is going to have a pattern, but start looking at stocks that make some really long-term, nice moves and see what characteristics they have. So one of the things he was asking is, what is your process? Well, my process is to study and study and study and study and study markets like the TFM 10% system. I'm like, okay, well, geez, I need a market timing system that's going to get me out of the way when things start to go sour. Okay, when things start to go sour, how do I define when things start to go sour? Aha, 10%. Well, let's take a look at 10% moves going back to the 1900s, okay? And just in general, just looking at markets every day. I watch the market all day long. I probably should not be doing that. Although I stopped doing it yesterday to go get a freaking haircut. <laughs> and when I walked to the office, the futures had jumped about 30 points while I was gone. So I'm like, that's great. That's another story altogether. But notice the nuances, notice the behavior, learn how to read the tape. Again, study the general genuine article. And Keep in mind, it's, it's something I've said before, that years and years and years of mechanical system programming has actually made me a discretionary trader and to learn how to, to pick stocks. And like I said early on, I was helping somebody with their stock picking. I was doing the programming. I thought my job was to do the program, run the scans, and give them the, the results. Well, this gentleman expected a lot more from me. He expected me to go through those stocks and only give him the best stocks from the list. So in order to keep that gig, I had to learn how to read charts. I, up until then, I was doing a lot of mechanical testing. And then it, all of this made me realize that it's an art, not a science, but it can be learned. And as I said earlier, a lot of it is caught, not taught, but it can be learned. So that's what made me discretionary trading. Now, he was asking, what are you looking for? Well, I'm looking for an edge, not a grail. The holy grail doesn't exist. 
I'm fairly confident I would have found it based on all the research I've done in the past in all agro hunting. I'm also a member of the AAPTA, and I'm sure one of those guys or gals in that organization would have found it if there was one. Somebody like McMillan or Greg Morris. Over time, through a shit ton of empirical research, I was looking at a lot of charts, I have noticed things like Landry light, like the bow ties, okay? And I'm not looking per se, like every time I look at a chart, like, oh, I wanna find something here, I wanna learn something. It just sort of comes to me, right? From looking at all these charts. As I've said 10,000 times when I'm speaking in person, I ask the audience, okay, anybody here a musician? And then of course, by the laws of averages, somebody raises their hands and I'm like, okay, how did you get good? And they look at me like I pooed in my pants. It's like, I practice, dumbass implied. Well, you wanna get look at you wanna get better at reading charts? Look at a lot of charts every day. Now you need something that's gonna be easy to recognize and follow. And, and bow ties, for instance, pretty damn easy to follow, pretty damn easy to recognize. And in many years ago, 20 years ago, that became one of my most popular patterns really quickly. And then Lately, I've been working with Landry Light more and more and more and more, and that seems to be gaining a little traction with a lot of people because, aha, that makes sense. I could see it. If you can't see it, underneath it, there's an illustrator, not an indicator, an illustrator illustrating the number of bars of Landry Light. And that's in, uh, Metastock has it in their, pa in their package. ACP, which is Stock Charts package, now has it in my plugin, which is free. I keep saying for now but it's uh, free for now. <laughs> How do you collect data? I've only seen your data file on the TFM 10% system. Do you have other files you could share that show what data you use for your analysis? Well, I no longer program. In fact, at this present time, I don't have any, any programs where I could get in and do some hardcore programming. I, I do take that back. I do some meta stock programming here and there, but I don't do a lot of system analysis and system testing there other than by hand if I were to develop something there. So everything now is done by hand. Uh, I often think, well, I need to get back into TradeStation or Easy Language or whatever. I used to program in that. But I know me. If I start going down that rabbit hole, I'm going to spend hours and hours programming and go back to the old the old day from many, many years ago doing all, doing all that system testing. And I think that... You just keep it simple and, and, and don't try to do all these fancy things and then test things by hand because there's going to be times where you don't have a mechanical system, but it looks pretty good, a mechanical signal, but it looks pretty good. And you might want to be in the market. There'll be other times where you have a mechanical system like the, uh, a signal. Like a while back, we had a, a TFM 10% buy and I overlooked it. I put it in the spreadsheet to, to be on, you know, keep things honest, right? But I overlooked it and stayed out of the market because I didn't like the way the market had shot up and came back in. And the other thing that happened, as I've said a thousand times, but I like my moving averages big and thick. And I was thinking of jokes there, but I better not. But I like them big and thick and the, the moving average was so thick, it was touching the bottom of the bar. So there, it, there, was, there was actually Landry light there, but the moving average was so thick, it was touching the bar, right? So. I didn't see the Landry light, plus it closed poorly. It was down in a week hard. I'm like, well, that's obviously not a signal. And I got an email from one of you guys that said, yes, it is. I'm like, oh, you're right. Just like early in my career, again, as I kind of alluded to a second ago, I would show setups to this gentleman and like, well, here's your setup. He's like, that's not my setup. I'm like, yes, it is. And I know I need some new stories, but we'd go back and forth and I'd walk him through it and I'd walk him through the programming. And he goes, well, I don't like it. So. Now, I'm not a mechanical trader, but in more recent years, I have incorporated some mechanical trading into my longer term analysis. For instance, as I said a few minutes ago, I'm long the queues based on the TFM 10% system. And to my surprise, that's working out pretty good. It's, it's like it's beating almost everything else that I've been doing lately. Um, maybe not the SYM trade, which just began to take off a little bit. But other than that, it's doing pretty damn good. I forget. Uh, how many points are in there, 15 points or whatever so far. Now, when the market began to tank 
on this last sell-off earlier this year, I have some, as I've said before, I don't do a lot of long-term market timing and long-term positioning, okay? Maybe in my next life I will. But I don't also don't want to be trading my daughter's accounts like the rabbit's going for the cocaine. And uh, I know Larry Larry McMillan like trades different people in his family's accounts using all his stuff and all. But I think that's really cool. But I'm a little nervous to do that. Uh, I would much rather just keep it more simple and keep them like in a little bit longer term market timing type of stuff because they're younger. And I want them to be in the market as much as possible. But obviously, I want them to be out of the way when the market tanks. So I pulled them out of the market on the last TFM 10% sell signal and I put them back in on the last buy. So something simple like that, I'm going to keep them in and out of the market. So I do a little bit of that. And just for S and G's to play along, I, I bought some Q's, not much, 100 shares. And again, I'm playing along. So I will do that type of thing. And I will pay attention, of course, to any type of signal, like I just said, bow ties and Landry light and all these other things, especially off of new highs and new lows. How do you analyze the data? Well, of course, you need to ask yourself, in general, does the concept work, okay? And then again, could you actually follow it, okay? Now, if you go down the system programming designing rabbit hole, you're gonna be faced with things like uh, maximum adverse excursion and uh, maximum favorable excursion and so on and so forth. And that'll lead you to believe that, okay, So every time the system has a, let's say the system has a, a 20% loss, okay? And you notice that it never comes back once it goes in a hole about 4%, okay? So you put in that 4% rule, oh, I'm selling thing down 4%. Well, in the future, that 4% becomes like 4.5% or whatever. So you get knocked out of a bunch of good trades. You also look at it and say, okay, my maximum maximum favorable excursion is, let's say you make 20%. Seems like anytime you make 20%, that's the most you ever make on the system, it comes back in and stops you out. So you're like, aha, anytime I'm about 20%, I'm going to take it because it never makes more than 20%. Well, guess what? The next trade is going to go up 100 or 200, 300, 400, and you're going to miss out. So I think all the statistics, are worthless and i mean 75 percent of all people know that statistics are worthless <laughs> so again i'm not going to follow this 100 mechanically but i will heed the warnings and in select cases yes i will follow them mechanically uh you know the, the buy at b is something that's somewhat mechanical but there's a lot of discretion involved i mean i probably could work hard to to give it all the rules. And one thing I was thinking about right before I went live was I did meet somebody once and uh, I was talking to him in person and he was actually working on something that could probably, could maybe eliminate all the discretion and stuff that I'm talking about. That made me a little bit nervous and I'd like to know how he's doing. I have to look him up. It's like, I'm afraid that he'd start looking at my stuff again and. You know, so you could, the point I'm trying to make there is you can put some rules, general rules into place that will make you a little bit more mechanical than than maybe you think you are. And that would be like a good example, again, coming back to the IPOs is like, okay, well, I had a $20 rule and then now they seem to be, it seems to be some of the 20 to $30 uh, IPOs have taken off quite a bit over the last five or six years. So the $20 rule is kind of more of a guideline and now it's more like a $30 rule. And then there's volume requirements. And I just kind of look at that by hand. I'm sure you could mechanize that. But I would caution you into not mechanizing things too much. Use a little common sense. Get a little experience. Look at a few charts and get the idea. Well, the we've got a lot more to cover there. So I'm going to pick that up in upcoming weeks. But thank you so much for the question. It It really makes my job a heck of a lot easier. So let's shift gears. And let's go over to crypto real quick, and then we'll pop in the overall market. If you guys want to ask about any crypto pairs, any stocks, 
go ahead and start doing that now. And then we'll be the stocks in just a few minutes. I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time on crypto. There's not a whole lot to talk about tonight. Okay, um, let's see what the C-Web's doing real quick. Okay, so this is the one, still long, this one. Y'all know what they do? I have no idea. <laughs> I don't care as long as they go up, right? Don't confuse the issue with facts. There's Ethereum. Ethereum, not looking so hot, okay? It looks like it's kind of rolled over in here, just not looking too good. And Bitcoin, unfortunately, is not looking so hot either. Now, kind of a longer term bull on Bitcoin, which I got to be careful with. I know you got to be, can't drink your own Kool Aid, right? Or whatever. Drink the Kool Aid. Uh, drink your own Kool-Aid? That doesn't sound <laughs> very savory. But you can see we've got Landry Light to the downside here. So that's of a little bit of concern. So it's kind of sideways a little in here. But yeah, I'd like to see it back above that 30 EMA. As a general statement, if you want to trade crypto or maybe any other market for that matter, don't buy anything below the 30 EMA. And that's going to keep you out of a lot of trouble just real quick let me show you something here let's see something so let's take a look at the ugliness out there oh did we just roll over we must have just rolled over yeah i hate when every time i go to do a show that they roll them over but anyway as you look at some of these you'll see like if something's ugly it's going to be below the 30 ema and like that one that one that one that one, you know, you see all these are, are headed down and they're still below the 30. So that one little rule in and of itself should keep you out of a lot of trouble. You're welcome. All right, let's just, uh, any individual pairs you guys want to look at real quick? Let's just see what's moving tonight or recently. See like that one there, it's up 38%, but it's below the EMA, okay? That one, that one, eh, that one's kind of all over the place. I haven't seen a whole lot to get excited about. In fact, that C-Web, I think, is the last trade I made. And that's been a few weeks. But the thing about crypto is it can heat up really quickly. But right now, I'm just not seeing a whole lot. And as I've said a thousand times before, when the market is really blowing and going, sometimes you could just sort by relative strength, meaning the percent change, and just buy the strongest pairs. Okay, let's shift gears. Let's hop into stocks. And we'll take a look at uh, any stocks you guys want to look at. I know we talk stocks all day long. Ever since the uh, Facebook group, we don't have as many stock picks for these webinars. But we'll get some new people in here, some fresh faces with some new stuff. Let's take a look at the overall market and drill down to some sector actions. Action. There's the NASDAQ, as you can see, we have broken out and we have taken out this recent high in here. The Q's, a little bit easier to see it. The Q's, uh, two nights ago, I told my premium clients that this, this wedge was concerning me. That we're just kind of drifting higher in here. And in order for me to get excited about the market, it would have to break out of this wedge to the upside. This is kind of a bearish wedge. Nothing I would short off of, uh, but I certainly want to be cautious when I see this action in the market. And then yesterday we broke out and today we had tremendous follow through on that. So knock on wood so far, so good there. Let's take a look at the P's, S&P 500. We did break out past the top of this little range in here. So that's a good news. And guess what? This is a new closing high going back all the way till, let's see, last August, okay? So we're closing in on one-year highs in the S&P 500, and we had a little stealthy buy signal a few weeks ago, or eight weeks ago, in the TFM 10% system. If you check my website for the, I think I changed the word bear to bull for the bull market updates. Now, keep in mind, everything changes quickly. A few days ago, I was very concerned about the market, and that's what a trend, that's what trend following is all about, like the hokey pokey, right? You look at the market every day and see what it's doing right now it's trying to break out it keeps following through then we might have ourselves a little bit of a bull move on the way but hard to argue with the nasdaq looking like that and one thing i was woke up thinking about this morning is a lot of I know, things you wake up you know, day the things you wake up thinking about have changed but a lot of people are poo-pooing this rally because the 
breath is not there. Well, I hear you. It's kind of narrow leadership, but I think what's what's happening, and this is a gut feel, this is nothing you can quantify, but I think what the market is doing is it's trying to fool the most amount of people, and that's the market's job. That's an old Wall Street adage kind of paraphrase, but I think that's what's happening, and that's, again, that's hard to quantify, but but I'm not I'm not uh, selling the form betting the form or anything right now, just yet. Rusty, Rusty, ugh, it's just still a mess in here. It's just all over the place and sideways. Take a look at the weekly chart. It's still all over the place and sideways too. I sure like to see it just get out of this low level sideways range. Energies, as I would say, quite a bit looking toppy still, but I wouldn't rush out and short them because they're they're kind of hanging in there within this wide loose range. If they begin to break down from the range. It might be worth a shot. Now, keep in mind that your prior leaders coming into a bear market or through a bear market or rarely your leaders coming out of it. Now, even with that said, if energy start making new highs, then I'm a buyer because I'm a trend following moron. But as a general statement, that's something to keep an eye on. And I've talked about that quite a bit. Foods look pretty good. Foods are hard to get excited about. HV of uh, eight. Uh, last time I checked the peas, they were 15. So hard to beat the market with stocks that have low HV. Banks are kind of bottoming out here, at least banks overall. Now the regionals are not looking so hot. They took the brunt of the damage. But I'm very concerned or want to make sure I pay attention to the banks overall. So if the big boys get dragged down with some of these guys, I'd get concerned. But you can see the re even the regionals, which look kind of abysmal in here, they are trying to push into this overhead supply. If they can get past this overhead supply, I wouldn't be a buyer, but I would certainly think that that would be a positive sign for the market. Drugs are a bit of a bummer. They've stalled out a little bit. Maybe they're just going to catch a breath before they take off again, but they are stuck in a little bit of a short-term range. Biotech, today notwithstanding, has been doing fairly well in here. It just made multi-month highs, which is almost one-year plus highs. So that's a good sign. But obviously, I want to see some more follow-through and get past this prior peak in here before getting too excited there. So as you go through a lot of sectors, it's pretty mixed out there. But it's getting better and better and better, at least based on the last couple of days' action. Check back often, right? Hardware, AKA Apple computer, break it out to brand new highs. Take a look at software. If you got hardware, you're getting software for your hardware, right? And you can see it's a uh, multi, multi-month multi lows. That was a horrible movie, right? <laughs> I saw the worst movie the other night and I've been telling my friends how great it is. And I'm like, don't give up, don't get up. You gotta watch it till the end. It's gonna get better. Just, just watch to the end, just to kind of mess with them. But so far my wife's been with me and she stopped me. She's like, stop, stop, stop. The movie, in case you want to torture yourself, is Triangle of Sadness. <laughs> it was a horrible movie. Anyway, you can see uh, semiconductors. Look at that. See, I'm a big fan of the semis, and I was really bummed out over the last few weeks because these semis just couldn't get going. But aha, semis are beginning to break out now. So that's a great thing. I think, and you know, here's an idea for a system. And you guys, you want to do some research? Why not see if you can buy the market when the semis are outperforming the market and sell the market or stay out of the market when the semis are underperforming the market? Now, just do that empirically. Just take the semis, take the SOX index, and put a little colon after it and put in the, the Qs. That'd be a fun thing to do. I know you want to party with me. Put the SOX versus the Qs into stock charts and then hand test that put it in acp so you can move forward and backwards i i i would bet there's something there because conceptually as someone said before you know there's dow theory with uh the transports well in modern day the electronics is the information superhighway although there's still a lot of um I'm sure a lot of uh stuff being moved around right my daughter saw a sticker on a on a 18 wheeler that said, uh, tired of all these trucks? Stop buying shit, <laughs> which I thought was funny. So I think transports are still important. Speaking of which, we'll take a look at those guys. But I think the semis are more important in this day and age as far as the Dow theory is concerned. Transports all over the place, nothing to really gleam there, okay? But maybe if we get out of this longer term range, 
it would be a little bit more exciting, kind of hard to get excited about the semiconductors. Gold has been losing its luster as of late. You can see we gapped down today and it was looking decent not too long ago, but now it's beginning to look questionable. We had one on our radar. I just took it off recently. It didn't trigger, thank goodness. And then silver's looking pretty ugly in here, beginning to implode. The uh, commercial on TV are probably going to go crazy now that this thing is imploding. And the radio. <laughs> you know, so, so I heard an ad the other day. I think it's, uh, well, I don't want to say it publicly. But it's like, if you're like me, you can't afford to lose 30% of your money. It's like, okay, well, let's take a look at longer-term gold. Yeah, you're right. You can lose 50% of your money investing in gold long-term. Now, I do have some hard assets, but not enough to really make a difference. Uh, if the shit hit the fan, I might have a little silver to get me through a week. All right, uh, only one stock tonight, XRP. We'll take a look at that real quick. Oh, wrong one. XRP, XRP. Why is that not coming up? Do you, uh, is that transpose or something? XRP, what else could that be? XRP. I'm not sure what that is. Um, crypto. Oh, crypto. Oh, well. Yeah, would you, uh, yeah, we'll do that. Uh, what's that, Ripple? Yeah, so, yeah, just put, uh, I forgot to mention, when you, in crypto, uh, put USD after it. XRP, okay. Yeah, it's it's um nothing to get excited about there, okay, Frenchy. Uh it's gonna have overhead supply. You know, I'm more excited when, when crypto is looking like this, kind of going straight up, and then maybe play the pullbacks like I did in the C web. But yeah, I would leave that alone for now. It's weird. I saw I saw on the internet it was uh it said Doge was at all time highs, not on my charts. I don't know how that's all time highs, but, and you know, what's the rule we talked about earlier? Don't buy anything below the 30 EMA. All right, let's get back to stocks. And we'll go back there. Okay, Sam wants to know about ITCI. ITCI. Yeah, it looks good. Let's see. Let's pick it apart. Let's pick it apart. Okay. Little wide and loose longer term. I don't like the way it's just kind of bumping up against a prior high in here. Let's take a look at it. And you know, I'm kicking myself in the butt because I didn't uh, put this on Twitter. But notice that like Sim, you could see it's fairly persistent. It's accelerating. This is one that we're long now. Sam, I forget, if you're in the service, you probably know this one. But uh, anyway, you could see it triggered a pullback. It didn't do much at first, but then it began to take off today in earnest, but it's kind of clean, accelerating. It's got most of the markings of a really good setup there. So let's take a look at, let's go back to ITCI. So now as I begin to kind of look at this and pick it apart, okay, what do we have here? Okay, so we've got, we've got one month of complete sideways trading here, okay? So that's sideways movement, so that's of, that's of concern. Uh, again, it's wide and loose. It's toward the old highs. I think I would hold off until you could find something that's a little bit cleaner than that. So hang on on those. Okay. All right. Any more stock picks? Going once, going twice. All right. Well, as usual, I want to thank all you guys and girls for attending tonight. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule. Look like we hit a record tonight. So thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome, Sam. Any other answers to questions, daviddavidlander.com. If you're in Facebook, just bring them up there. I'll be happy to uh, to noodle them with them. And, and usually by the time I get to the questions, one of you guys has already uh, answered it. And it, it just saves me a lot of trouble, which is nice. I thank you for that. Anyway, everybody have a great weekend. Everybody else, I'll see you tomorrow and Facebook. And may the trend be with you.